Greetings, dear brethren. It's nice to see you all here this morning. And we're really enjoying the wonderful fellowship of the convention. And it's such a blessing to be with you here. And I want to welcome Brother John here. Welcome, Brother. Good to see you this morning. You know, we've had uh, uh, wonderful discussions, Brother John and I, preparing for this, uh, this meeting over the last many weeks, having the opportunity. And I really enjoyed that fellowship that we've had together and uh, be able to study together a little bit and, and try to develop this lesson for us this yeah, morning. We've done that uh, online, we've done that here, and uh, I think the fellowship uh, is going to be very profitable. I've learned a great thing, and I've learned to know who Brother Mark Davis is. I've never had this opportunity, so I thank the Lord for that. And uh, again, like you have mentioned, to the dear brethren, uh, Sister Esther and I and our family, our entire family, are happy to be here. So um, enjoying this, enjoying this study. And I have to say, dear brethren, that the magnitude of this, this phrase, for my name's sake, is just unbelievable when you look into it. Um, and I think if I can label it to one specific time period for us, it was this convention. Everything I heard, fellowship from the platform, testimonies, it was all for the Heavenly Father and His dear Son's sake, for my name's sake. So I think we'll start, uh, Brother Mark. Um, one of the things that I was trying to understand is the origin, the, the, the etymology, the, the background of where this where the name's sake, for my name's sake, came from. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, when we uh, look back in the stream of time and we go back into the 1600s when the King James Version of our Bible was um, developed and that translation came forward, uh, this, this, the usage of this name was kind of introduced to us for his namesake. And really it is from the Hebrew idiom, meaning to protect one's reputation or possibly vouch for one uh, for one's reputation. Right. And you know, so we uh, hear about this and we have the example in Psalm 23. We're gonna come back to this in a little bit, but this was used to be a common uh, scripture, Psalm 23, three, that young children would learn he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Mm -hmm. and, that's, uh, and that's something that children grew up learning in, uh, in uh, just as a general principle in the way they would live their lives. But I thought I might want to just take you back for a moment and think about names in general. You know, when you think about, you know, when we come to convention, uh, especially when you come to a large convention like general convention, you know, soon after you start sitting down with a bunch of brethren and they, and they say, well, sister, who are you related to here? And That's right. brother, who are you related to here? And then pretty soon they give you their whole family tree with 10 different divisions. And the oh, next yeah. thing you know, can you please send that to me in the mail? I would certainly appreciate it so I can understand how we are all related. And you know, this doesn't just apply to, to Bible students. Uh, but also uh, mankind is interested in where they came from. You know, uh, who were my ancestors? You know, how many, how many uh, generations back can I go to see who I came from? And am I honoring their name, their namesake, their, the value of their reputation? And, you know, uh, I was thinking of in my own case, you know, just a few months back, I was looking into the origins of the Davis name. And, you know, from my time period, I can go back nine generations wow. to the Davis name. And the only reason I can do that is because the Quakers kept such good records. And they had a lineage of all the Davis names, and I could go from one generation to one to generation after generation after generation. But I have to go back only four generations to find the time when 
a coal porter during the time of Brother Russell in the early 1900s came through Southern California because the, the Quakers that were part of my family line came out of England uh, during the early 1700s. And they settled first in Pennsylvania, then they moved on to North Carolina, then they moved to Iowa, and eventually they moved to Southern California to a little town called El Medina. And my great, great grandfather was uh, a, in the Quaker fellowship in the Friends Church there. But there, my great grandfather's wife, Ella, Sister Ella, she uh, heard a coal porter come through California that gave her the truth that Brother Russell was teaching in his day. And Sister Ella gave the truth to her husband, Macy, my great grandfather. And they resigned their, in, by a letter, their fellowship with the Quakers and started meeting with the Bible students. I mean, I... So this is four generations ago uh, that I can trace back uh, in the family tree to, to the family. I don't know in your own case. I've, whether John... I've, uh, I've never traced it back to that, that far. Uh, the, to, to me, th th this is very unique. Uh, when, when I looked at this for my name's sake, I have to define it in, in, in a particular way. And it's, it's a form of identity and uniqueness. So when I look at my generational background, specifically, I was named a certain way. And it was my dad's father. His name was John. And uh, he was an elder in the Polish class. And they used to have big Polish classes, if some of the brethren are here or some online uh, know of that. And, and uh, so I, I looked up to him. He was like a patriarch in the family. And I was named after him. And then I was also named after my uncle, uh, my dad's youngest brother, uh, Henry. And uh, so my name became John Henry. And uh, it's interesting because it was kind of endearing. There were some brethren who used to address me that way, John Henry. And uh, the name Trezac, now, uh, that's not the way it's, when you see it the way you see it on the program, brethren, that's Stjechak. That's not Trezac. And, oh. and it's quite an experience for those brethren who are seeing it on, uh, and especially online, and especially the Polish brethren. Um, my name came from, and I looked as far back as to where my grandfather, my dad's father came from, and that was Zakupani in Poland. And I had the privilege of going there. I wanted to go with Sister Esther, and we had some fellowship with, with the dear brethren that helped us to get there. And I found out where they came from, a beautiful town in Poland. So, uh, the, those things are very endearing to me. So when I was named John Henry Szczechak, John Henry Trezak is what brethren call me, um, I look up to that and I want to respect that. I want to respect their name for my name's sake. And uh, I tried to do that my whole life. I, I didn't do very well as a young man and, and I'll share some of those things maybe if we have time, but uh, I, I truly respect it. Yeah. So yeah. the idea was you were trying to honor those that came before you in like the way the you left trying. Your life. Yeah. trying. <laughs> well, we all are trying, definitely, indeed. So we have, all of us have a long history. Uh, but let's focus a little bit more now on the Christian aspect of this. So this is our question. How would a namesake have real meaning for a Christian as referred to in Scripture? Well, like I said, uh, Brother Mark, when, I, when we started out here, it, the magnitude of this particular phrase is just unbelievable. So I started looking and I said, what is meaningful to me? How far can I go back? So for my name's sake. So, uh, you, you know, you go back to the Garden of Eden. That's one of the first places. And that didn't work out too well for my name's sake. So I said, well, I'm going to move a little uh, further and, and, uh, and uh, you know, closer in time. So I went to the Genesis account 
the 12th chapter. And I looked at verses one through three. And I'd like to read two and three first, and then I'll come back to one. Okay. And because I like what it said, and, and it had some meaning to me. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I thought, wow, that, that, that's a wonderful statement. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And, and when you look at that in the Greek, it's or be seen as blessed. So I, I appreciated that. And then the third verse says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And then this real nice statement, and all people on earth will be blessed because of you. Now, I couldn't think of something better and for my name's sake, when I read that, what did that mean to me? Well, I have to go back to the first verse now. We said, that the Lord said to Abram. So if he said that to Abram, he's saying it to me. Go from your country. Now, that's an objective. You know, that, that's something I've got to yeah. make a decision on. And he says, your people in your father's house to the land I will show you. Now, I have to decide in my mind if that's what I want to do for his name's sake. And there was a time in my life, and I'm sure your life and a lot of brethren, where they made that decision. Well, interesting, I'll tell you a story. And I heard this, I think it was from my dear wife, between uh, my brother and I. We grew up together, Tom and I. And uh, Tom told <clears throat> Esther, he said, it, it's, it's like this consecration. It's like this, something happened to John. We were walking and we came to a fence. And John went over the fence and he kept going. And I stayed. And not until years later, and it wasn't much longer than that, he learned too that you've got to make that transition. You've got to make that commitment and then keep going. And no matter what may happen, you, you have to appreciate what position you have taken and what decision you have made for my name's sake. Did I totally understand it then? I don't think so. So that, that led me to thinking, where can I go further with this? And so now I'm going to ask you a question, Brother Mark. And it goes to the Psalms that, that you made a reference to. Well, can I go back and, and follow up with your with well, I, a little certainly. bit to go right Genesis 12th scripture that you gave us, which is so uh, center for us, focused on uh, what God asked Abram to do. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to leave his own country and go to a place that God would show him. And we can go into Matthew, and in Luke, we go into Matthew, we can see the lineage all the way from our Lord Jesus back to Abram, Abraham. First chapter. Yep. And then we can go into Luke, the third chapter, we can see the lineage through Mary's line all the way back uh, through Nathan, and then on to uh, continue all the way back to Adam Very as good. a son of God. Excellent. But then we can connect it with the scriptures in Galatians, which I think is so prominent when you talk about it be a seed of blessing, where we're told in Galatians 3.29, if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed yes. and heirs according to the promise. So we, as a seed of blessing for all of mankind, we see that as the privilege is coming into the body of Christ, that we will have this wonderful privilege to bless mankind in the coming kingdom. So this is a wonderful heritage that we've been given uh, through by our Heavenly Father. And uh, it's humbling to think about. So I, I'm glad you brought up that Galatians. I mean, I put the cap right on the point I was considering in, in the Genesis account. That That is... Uh, something that where we have to make that commitment and we have to know what that commitment is for for yes. my name's sake and i i can't help but 
keep reiterating that because it has to be founded on our Lord. I, I was thinking, okay, I'd like to understand the Heavenly Father's arrangement, but I can't do that unless I understand his son. And, and the world out there has so much difficulty with that because of this Trinitarian concept. So understanding, so that's why I went to the Genesis account and what he said to Abram, the Heavenly Father. And now we're asked at this time in our life, especially in this Laodicean period, looking at it and saying, I have a pattern to follow. I just had to find that pattern. When I went, I decided to go over that fence and keep going. Now I had to find that pattern as a young man. I had to find out why is this happening to me? What's going on in my life? And when I found that through the scriptures, through study, that it led me to our Lord, then that led me truly to the Heavenly Father. And I understood who he was through his son and found out the whole concept of love and what it meant. So, yeah. so now coming back to this Psalms appreciation, um, I liked it very much what, what you brought forth. Now I, I'd like to read uh, Psalms uh, 23, one through three, but I have a specific question. Mm -hmm. it's, in, it's, it's at the latter part here. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. So I'm finding out you have, so many of us have. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's beautiful. He leads me beside still waters. That's wonderful. But he restores my soul. That's the part I had a little bit of difficulty with. you have any thoughts? Well, you know, this... This scripture and uh, that was given to us in Psalm, uh, the twenty-third Psalm, it's just such a beautiful uh, picture for That's us. It. He restoreth my soul; he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for the name's sake. You know what does that mean? You know I can look at scriptures also in Psalm that have the same, uh, this are uh, using the same terminology. Uh, for instance, in, um, uh, in Psalm 2511, it says, God forgives our sins for his name's sake. That's Psalm 2511. And we're told in, God, in Psalm 31.3, God leads us for the sake of his name. And then in Psalm 79.9, it says, God delivers us from sin for his name's sake. And then we have Psalm 109, 21. God deals with us because his loving kindness is good for his name's sake. So did you, when I read those scriptures, I see it's answering your question about restoring my soul. And it really... I look back on the attributes of God, his character mm -hmm. of wisdom, power, justice, and love. And I see all those answered or reflected in these scriptures as it talks about of his, of his namesake. Yeah. And, and I think here's the point. Why is God doing this? Why is he making a family to represent him as sons of God, to be associated with him and his dear son? And the point is, God does what he does for his sake. For his sake, he does what he does. And I appreciated the lessons earlier in the week that talked about that God is love. God is light. And how, and the wonderful attributes that God has that we want to uh, reflect, uh, reflect as much of him as we can in our own lives and, and he has designed this plan to um, have his name honored by all people. You know, he, he doesn't do things to, to be forsaken by people, but he does it to have his name honored for his namesake, his reputation. But it's done out of love. And it's so far above, we can hardly even imagine this. So I think this is a wonderful picture. You know, we can go into... Psalm, the 
50th chapter, verse 5. It says, Gather my saints together to me, those who, that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, about sacrifice and what that means. But maybe let me come back to a question for you, because you read the beginning of Psalm 23.1. You said, The Lord is my shepherd. And I thought, well, what does that mean? Yeah, um, you know, that's something I had to think about uh, very strongly here. And I appreciate uh, the, the point you're bringing out here as far as the third verse, it restores my soul. And, but who does that? And so then I, when we, then you come back to the first verse and you say, the Lord does that. Well, how does he do that? Especially when you see such a dark system out there and you brought out the point of light. And the Heavenly Father is the light. His Son is the light. So this shepherd that we're looking for is the light. And, and I, had, I, I had this question in my mind, Brother Mark. So uh, I said, do, uh, do I exist for the benefit of the shepherd or for myself? Because sheep, when I looked at that, the Lord is my shepherd, I have, to, I have to find out, okay, who am I then? I'm one of his sheep. Well, I'm finding out, you know, when I studied about sheep here, I, you know, I like to share a few things. You know, sheep have no defense. You know, when they're thrown out in the pasture, they have no defense whatsoever. They're very meek and, and docile. And I have to keep that in mind when I think of the system we have today. You know, when you look at Numbers 27, 17, it says the shepherd will go out and come in before them. One who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Now that hit home to me. And, and secondly, when, when, I, when I saw this, it, it, it brings out a point of more understanding. Uh, sheep are notorious when I, when I studied them a little bit under, under this shepherd. They're notorious for following the leader. <clears throat> so then I got to make the right choice because there's all kinds of leaders out there. Uh, regardless of how dangerous or foolish that may be. They'll follow a leader. So like sheep, human beings are extremely gullible. And we look at that, well, when an, an attractive or charismatic situation seems to come up, especially in the media today, do we follow that? Do we look at that? So that's another point of the sheep here. So it leads me to Matthew 9, 36. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And I don't want to be that. So I want to focus on the true shepherd. And the third point that I came up with is in Isaiah 53, 6, which sheep are prone to wander away from the flock. And I've done that in my life. A sheep's only chance of survival is with the flock under the care of the competent shepherd, yet sheep become, can become overconfident, can become rebellious, distracted, and they wander away. They spy greener grass. And that hmm. reminded me of a scripture. And it goes back to Psalms, Psalm 79, 13, in the King James. So we thy people, and sheep of thy pasture. So he's taking us to his pasture. Emphasis on that. We'll give thee thanks forever. We will show forth the praise to all generations. And I can't help but think of a story. When I was a young man, about seven years old, my grandfather, my Jaji and Busha had outside a pasture. And there was a cow out there. And I was always inquisitive about everything. I wanted to know things. And 
as a boy, about seven years old, I never wore shoes. So I wander around everywhere because I love walking barefoot. So I go out in the pasture, goose eyes hollering, be careful when you go out there. And I go out to the cow and the cow's chewing its cud and looking and I'm petting the cow. And then I step back and I first found out what a cow pile was. And, and, and that was not good. So I, I said, you know what? Uh, I need help. So there's Bouchard saying, come here. And she cleaned me out. There's my shepherd. There's the one who directed me to, and I learned a lesson. So, uh, you know, when I look at that in my life, I got to be careful for the cow piles that are out there. You know, I could back up and I could think of things. And because I am a sheep and I'm learning, uh, I got to watch where I step for his name's sake. And I was just going to follow up on that and you know, thinking about the, the relationship of a shepherd to his flock, to his sheep. You know, when we think of our Heavenly Father as the overall shepherd of, of, of uh, the Lord's people indeed of all of his creation right and uh and we know that god knows everyone by name just as uh, a shepherd would know all the names of the sheep and the sheep recognize the voice of the master shepherd and we can even transition this to uh as the lord is the shepherd so our lord jesus says I will never leave thee or forsake thee, but I will watch over thee and guide thee. And so we can take great confidence that we are not left alone with, without any helpers to hope to guide, direct us uh, through what, what the provisions that God has made through his dear son That's right. and through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We are not left alone, but we can hear his voice through the precious word that he's given to us to understand the paths that we should go, the, the way we should try and lead our life. So that's just a follow up to your- this And not shepherd. try to leave that flock because we right. can wander. You know, there's all kinds of pastures out there. There certainly are. They need to focus. So I'd like to come back though, to Psalms 23 and ask you another question in that third verse again. Uh, and I'm gonna just quote that area. And you could do whatever you, you, you feel in your heart, it tells you. But it says, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What, what does that mean? He leads me in paths of righteousness. What Can you tell me? Some so things? I was looking at it from the aspect of uh, what does it really mean to a true Christian to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. If we are walking in the paths of righteousness, are we walking in the footsteps of Jesus? I would put it in that perspective. Um, and doing it, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. You know, in John, in the second, his letter, in his second epistle, he writes, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That's 1 John 2, 12. And Psalm 106, verse 8, uses exactly the same phrase. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power be known to all mankind. And clearly this phrase means for the sake of showing his abilities and his character of a loving Heavenly Father, caring for the flock. So returning to Psalm 20, it means that when I am being led in the paths of righteousness, it, it's, it's for the sake of demonstrating his character. But what if I don't demonstrate that in my life? You know, he's talking about wandering off in a different direction. I'll come back to that a little later. What if I don't... Um, walk in a lifestyle of righteousness, then it won't be his true character that's demonstrated um, by what I'm doing. If, 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 and, and easily can be seen by others. 
if I'm not operating and demonstrating his loving character in what I'm doing, if I'm going down a, a, another path in life, am I, is the purpose in my life to uh, glorify God's name? Am I doing that? Obviously not. And others will see that. Sure. And they say, well, you call yourself a Christian? And, and what are you doing? So it's something for us to think about. Uh, but... Being very mindful of that. This very is a, important. This is an amazing opportunity to show his character through our own walk in the footsteps of Christ Jesus. So I hope that answers your questions as, uh, a tiny bit there about why the path that we're following. So that's... Well, well it does, uh, Brother Mark, because when you talked about he restoreth my soul, how does he do that in the paths of righteousness? I have to learn what those paths of righteousness are. And I think we've touched on that quite intently here in regards to our Heavenly Father and His dear Son. That's the path mm -hmm. that leads to righteousness. And I have to be able to stay on that path. We found out in our studies, and I'm sure you have as well, it's pretty narrow. And if you narrow wander way. off that, uh, you could trip, you could fall. And it's sometimes hard to get back up on that path. So much so that, that the trials and the difficulties to do that can maybe take you further away. It's a narrow way, that righteous path. And, and uh, sometimes that's hard to find and stay on. But what is so wonderful is that we, when we do err and maybe for a short time, maybe go away that we shouldn't, and we recognize that, well, are we following the paths that the Lord would have us go? We can come before our Heavenly Father through his dear son to ask forgiveness and for guidance in the way we should be uh, living our lives and exactly. for his, his correction. And this should be daily in our prayers, uh, asking for his counsel and watch care over us. So let me focus on another question here. And this is uh, one talking about, but what about this idea of suffering? For Christ's sake, you know, the term is used for my namesake, and it's also used in reference to Jesus for, uh, for Christ's sake or for his namesake. What is this idea about suffering about? Um, how, might, how might you look at that thought? I know you had something in, in, I, uh, in Acts you wanted to bring up. To yeah, us. I wanted to bring that up, but uh, no one likes to suffer. And so much of that is going on in the face of this earth. That's why we continue to pray earnestly for thy kingdom. One of the accounts <clears throat> that uh, was near and dear to my heart in regards to this, uh, what about the idea of suffering for, for his name's sake? One of them that stood out to me very strongly was in Acts 7. And I'll paraphrase a little bit for, for the sake of time. It's Acts 7, 50 through 58. Um, and it talks about a person standing up. This is a council, and there was one of the brethren in there standing up for his name's sake. And that was Stephen. And what that dear brother went through, it's, it's hard to imagine how, how strong that individual was because of that particular counsel to the point of, and, and if I may, and I'm talking about the stoning of Stephen. If I, if I go to that 54th verse, <clears throat> he says, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, him standing up for his namesake, our heavenly father and his dear son, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. In the 55th verse, it says, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, which is what we are trying to accomplish in this suffering aspect, looked up to the heaven and saw the glory of God. That's what our Lord would always do. Remember when he was feeding the 5,000, when he was helping, he said, Hold on a minute. And he looked up into heaven and he prayed and then he was able to accomplish 
That's what Stephen was doing. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he, he was affected by that particular appreciation of God's arrangement. And 56, it says, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And isn't that a beautiful statement to make? I think we can all make that. In 57, as this, as this they covered their ears. They didn't want to hear this. And yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him because of that. Meanwhile, the witness laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. And I thought of that, and I'd like to share a story with you, just a short one here. You know, I, I had a particular project that I was doing. I was, I was the supervisor on a project, and I had a bunch of men working for me and uh, working for the owner of this particular place. And one individual was working for me was a good friend, an excellent employee was there all the time, did his job, did what he was supposed to do. And for some reason, which I don't know even to this day, the owner of the company was there and came around and asked. So I took him out to where we did things. And he said, I don't like that person. And he was pointing to the person I'm talking about, the friend that I had. And I asked him, I said, well, for what reason? And he said, I don't know, I just don't like him. I want you to fire him today. And I go, well, we ended our conversation and I didn't fire him. And the word got out. And I usually go to the office in the morning at the company and pick up the particular uh, things that I need to know about certain things on the project so I could press that on the men. And lo and behold, on the board were two envelopes. One was for this gentleman that I appreciated, and uh, in it was his check. He fired him. The other envelope was mine. And I had the same thing. Oh, no. So I lost my job. So I said, Lord, I stood up for righteousness sake. I stood up for what I felt, what I felt in my heart was right. And I said, why would this take place? So here in this particular situation, you're seeing Stephen, he lost his life by a person who eventually saw the light. Now, can you imagine what Saul thought later when his transition in Acts 9 that I think I make reference to, that now he sees something different, thinking back, about now his brother, Stephen. Yeah. So that, that's just a thought I, I want to share. Do you, you have a I, I really appreciate that thought, this idea of uh, uh, about suffering. You know, when you think about this, go back to our Lord's first advent and what he was teaching his disciples and those that were gathered around him. I remember this the, on the Sermon of the Mount, he said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Think about that. For, for my sake. This is Jesus talking. And I think of some other scriptures has, that were mentioned to us in Romans, we're told, for thy sake, this is Paul speaking, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Mm -hmm. So this idea of suffering. And uh, then our Lord Jesus also says in Matthew 10, 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. And so then we have... Uh, our Lord's the revelation given to us in Revelation 3, 21, that says to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I overcome and am set down with my father in his throne. And then the final scripture on this one, I, I like this thought about suffering. Are we, what does it mean to suffer for righteousness sake? I mean, is it, is it, is it a, a, a burden that we, that we drag along with us and, and we don't, and we feel like it's, it's, it's something terrible we have to endure? It? I don't think so. Yeah. I think we're doing this because we're falling in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus. That's what he's asked us to do for the glory of the heavenly father. And then in one scripture in Hebrews 12, two, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he, knew what he had to endure to go through, but he saw the joy that of, of the prospect of what was on the other side of all this. And we look at that the same way, I think, dear brethren, as, as, as we consider this. So I'll stop there because I know our time is short and uh, maybe we can go on to the well, next, well, next one. Well, we want to go into this area because I think it's important. Brethren have been talking about it and it is, it is something that is very uh, much in the news and important to us. So Brother Mark, we know there's a scriptural phase of the kingdom. We understand that. Why was Israel cast off from that? Is this something of importance to us in our consecration when we think about it now? Well, you know, natural Israel was God's chosen people. Yeah. And so you have to understand, well, why were they cast off? In Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, I'll just give you a couple of verses. It says in Ezekiel 36, 19 and 20, and it says there, and I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them. And when they entered into the, and then when they entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name when they said to them, these are the people of the Lord. By what they were doing, they were worshiping Baal and they were profaning God's holy name uh, so were they they certainly were honoring their namesake you know god right. was a chosen people so but did god leave it did was that the end of it i mean was god finished with them no because for his namesake it says in verse 21 but i had pity on my holy name which the house of israel had profaned among the heathen whether they went and so God was not going to, uh, for his namesake, he was not going to uh, um, just rid themselves of them, right. but he was going to give them opportunity, and that's going to be coming in the kingdom. So that's, and that we can go to Romans, I'll read just one verse. Romans eleven twenty seven says, concerning natural Israel, says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And so all we know that it says, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief, as it says in 11.32, Romans 11.32, that he might have mercy upon all. And so we look at that closing scripture, oh, the depth of riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways uh, past finding out. So we, the Lord has arranged this so that his name will be honored and bring Israel back into the fold. Exactly. And that's all part of God's plan of, of his kingdom. You know, it, it, just in regards to that, if I could make a scriptural statement here, and I didn't say it, Isaiah said it. And he said it in, in the 55th chapter in the 11th verse. He said, in regards to our Heavenly Father's arrangement for Israel, you know, uh, they were chosen. It, you only have I know. You know, these are things that 
Bibles the brethren know and understand. So when his word goes out, it says, so my word that goes out from my mouth, yeah. Heavenly Father's, will not return unto me empty. Yeah, unto me boy. Yeah, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it to Israel. Yeah. To, to uh, even though his plan continuing the way it is going, the developing of his church, but Israel will never be forgotten. Israel will be a part of this for my name's sake and they will understand it. And that brings us down to just a closing couple of questions here. Um, you know, you mentioned the Apostle Paul uh, being at the stoning of, of uh, Stephen. Stephen, but um, maybe you have some other, uh, I don't know if you have any other um, New Testament examples or phrases for my namesake that you wanted to bring up. I was going to bring up the Apostle Paul myself here just momentarily, but well, maybe you why don't some... you go ahead and do that because I, know, I, I like short. that. I like that transition. I like what would happen. To Paul. Well, you think about in the ninth chapter of Acts, we're given this account where Paul thinks he's doing the Lord's work, <laughs> the Heavenly Father's work. He isn't a follower of Jesus for sure. But uh, in the noonday sun, uh, the brightness above any light he ever saw, he was blinded. And he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why thou persecutest me? And this had to be the most humbling experience that Paul had to endure. Think about it. He had to go through blindness in order to see. You know, days later, he was his his eyesight recovered. But um, you know, that's the that's happened to many of us. I don't have time for this story, other than to say, you know, as I I grew up in the truth, from as I say, my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, down to down to my generation, and then passing this on to my children. Uh, but it took me all through. So I was raised in the truth, but I went out into the world. And it took the Lord, the Heavenly Father. I wanted to take a path down this way. And the Lord said, no, nope, you're going that way. <laughs> and when I tried to go the other way, he got my attention in a hurry. <sighs> Put me in the hospital, mm. broke my back. Oh, wow. Um, uh, really? Lost my flying career for a period of time. I didn't know that. And I said to the Lord, maybe there's a a different path I need to take. Yeah. And I started meeting with the brethren in Fresno. We had a beautiful class up here. Of the dear brethren, Bob and Jenny Wilson, Richard and Shirley Evans. Oh yeah. And uh, they took me into the fold. They were your shepherds at that time. You may be part of the training. class. Sure. Yeah. And later I symbolized the next year. Yeah. And followed a different path. So I don't regret any, any of that. Let's, let's just focus on one last thing. So we just have a couple minutes here. Right. Let's go to the last question. All right. For my namesake, how does this apply to the church down here at the end of the age? Are we following in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus? What did Jesus say in his prayer to his heavenly Father? And this focuses on John, the 17th chapter. Do you have any anything you want to share with that? Uh, or I could start off in the fourth verse. Well, if you the whole want. chapter is extremely, extremely beautiful. The, this prayer that Jesus uh, prayed on behalf of for those who would be for his name's sake, for his father's name's sake. And <clears throat> I focused specifically on the 11th verse for me, to be one with the father. You know, uh, <clears throat> we all know that the world is a mess. <laughs> and trying to come back from that, I remember a statement, uh, a question that I read in Brother Russell's writings, and I think it's on page 76 of the question book. 
And lo and behold, it, it's under a heading of chronology. And they asked Brother Russell about certain points on chronology, a certain date. And Brother Russell commented on 1914. And when he was done commenting on it, which he said, you know, this is the one thing that I think we should be about, telling about the good things to come. Everybody knows the bad things. Tell them about the hope, the good things that are coming forth, to be one with the Father, to understand God's plan and his message. So I, I really appreciated that. So your points. I'll focus on one verse in the prayer that our Lord Jesus gave to his Father, and that's verse 4. He said, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And that seems to be exactly the way our Lord Jesus led his life. He, everything he did was to glorify his father's name. That's, right. That's for his namesake as his dear son. And we are given that wonderful privilege now. Yeah, as the sons of God, yeah. and as our elder brother, our Lord Jesus, to follow in his uh, footsteps and glorify the Heavenly Father's name exactly in everything we do. Je Jesus said to the Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. I think, I think uh, all, all of the brethren feel that that they, you know, because the call was individually to each and every one of us, that they may be one as we are one. What, what a concept. When a team, and I'd like, to, I'd like to say this, because I was quite involved with sports, and I know what it takes. When a team works together, when brethren work together, you can't help but win. I've experienced that in that we become close we become as family and we can accomplish the goal for his name's sake and glorify the heavenly father even through these trials and difficulties brother mark thank you for the study thank you brother john appreciate it very much brother. what a beautiful lesson for us to consider honoring our heavenly father's name that's right and all that we do